So this talk is called Mythology of Flight. I have been mainly dealing with the mess made in Einstein's relativity, where mythology stroke falsehoods are taught. But it's not just in that area of physics stroke science that things are messed up. So I'm going to look at an, another example of that mess, namely that of flight. So I'll be dealing with this article from Discover. So the writer of that piece, after mentioning some people who are telling him he is wrong, then goes on to say, now that passions have had a chance to cool, I have two reasoned responses. That's to the people criticizing him. First, I'm right and you're wrong. Second, I am but a humble mouthpiece for the real heretics whom I should have acknowledged now is a better time anyway because they've just published a good book their names are david anderson and scott epperhard and the book is understanding flight and the book starts off by saying forget bernelli's theorem the question of how an airplane flies may seem like third grade science, but aeronautical engineers can and do disagree on it. And so what I want to know is that they do disagree about these things. And that's probably contrary to how the subject is taught. Teachers prefer to teach any subject and present the myth that a set object is settled science. So it's the same sort of problem that Galileo faced. He went against the accepted science of his day. And so I want to now give a few meanies about the thing as per this example of this cartoon. Uh, science has been thought to be settled several times throughout history and it gives a few examples. It used to think the earth was flat and that was sort of settled science. I think that's a really long time ago though when they used to think that because uh, if you go to the ancient Greek philosophers uh, what they came up with the earth was round. Also other ideas are like the earth is the center of the universe and I think, well, now they've got the problem of saying, where is the center of the universe? And then you got Aristotle thinking that heavier bodies fall faster than light ones, but uh, air resistance is what slows things down when it falls. And he wasn't really talking about that. So then you get onto the idea of the atom as the smallest particle. Well, I think that atom has been falsely named. It's a chemical atom now, and you can split chemical atoms, which are heavier than hydrogen anyway. So then it's going on to the more controversial thing about climate change. And it used to be said that the world is cooling and now it's changed to the world is warming. This Mimi is uh, slagging off people who say that the science is settled and it seems to be a political corruption of science that's going on. We have a leftist political agenda and hence unwillingness to properly do science with the political agenda they're trying to force on you the idea that the science is settled when really to do science properly you have to admit that 
it's a debate and an ongoing process of trying to find out things. So this is a Mimi to counter those who think science is settled. And this Mimi says science is never settled and it's always open for debate and new evidence. And the reason why science never gets settled is it keeps going on in this sort of circle. You make observations, think of interesting questions, formulate hypothesis, uh, develop testable predictions, gather data to test predictions, develop general theories, and then you make more observations. And in the middle, you've got the idea, refine, auto expand or reject the hypothesis. So you're just going around in this sort of loop all the time. And I presume that, that this is not properly taught and scientists come away from education believing the myth that the science has settled. Anyway, back to the example I'm highlighting on, on flight. Uh, Robert says, Scott and Eberhard are professor of aeronautics at the University of Washington, Seattle where he teaches a popular introductory class in, in the typical aeronautics curriculum. He says students are showered with complex equations, but are never given an intuitive understanding of what lifts an airplane. Most of the students who graduate today don't have a fundamental understanding because we haven't taught them that. So that's typical. Students are taught some maths about flight, but not taught understanding. And that's how a lot of the science subjects are taught. They're just taught a load of science, uh, mathematics, and they're not really given an understanding of that science. So what they form is about myths about what they have been taught. Robert goes on to say, Anderson, a physicist from Vermilad, had precisely that experience when he studied physics at the University of Washington de decades ago. When he says, this is what Anderson says, when I was through his course, I had a good intuitive of understanding of, phys of physics, but I didn't understand how a wing flew. I'd worked all the problems, aced all the tests, and I just had this feeling they were peeing on my boots and telling me it was rain. So the question now becomes, who do we blame? And Robert goes on to say, it is not fair to blame that kind of weather on Brunelli. And that's the peeing on your boot thing, or shoes and claiming it's the rain. Who died even before the first man sent in a hot air balloon but somewhere along the way in the 20th century his famous and perfectly true principle that's Bernanke's principle got misapplied in every man's explanation of aerodynamic lift so what we have my comment is misapplied that's just the typical method being used teach something that is correct and then corrupt it So Robert then explains the explanation, which is usually taught. Air flows faster over the top surface of the wing than underneath the bottom. Bernelli's principle says that the, when any fluid moves faster, for instance, as it passes a bottleneck in a pipe, the static pressure in it decreases. Therefore, boring Brunelli's logic, the air above the wing must be at lower pressure than the air below. That lifts the wing. But why in the first place does the air on top flow faster? That, said Anderson and Ebert Hard, is where the popular exclamation crashes and burns. 
So all that carries on. Even popularizers like me have wondered about the usual answer. The air flowing over the curved upper surface of the wing travels faster than the air traveling under the bottom. And so it has to travel faster to get to the trailing edge at the same time. The problem is there is no earthly reason why the air should get there at the same time. In fact, it doesn't. Someone somewhere, and let's hope it wasn't a science journalist, made up the principle of equal transit times. So the principle of equal transit times, that's a myth. It was added to the explanation of how there is flight. Robert goes on to say, the air on top actually gets to the trailing edge sooner than the air on the bottom because it really does travel faster. But the popular explanation doesn't tell you why, and thus it's no explanation at all. So my note is, so instead of giving an explanation, a myth was made. So this is the two people talking to each other, Anderson and Eberhard. We were chatting and I was asked, was kind of feeling him out, Anderson recalls, because if he was going to give me Bernelli, I w wasn't going to waste my, my money. So I said, what makes a wing fly? And he said, this is uh, Eberhard, Lift is a reaction force. The wing pushes the air down, so the air pushes the wing up. And I said, yes. Thus began a long collaboration that culminated in understanding flight. And this is what they mean, the book they come up with, is understanding flight. flight. Robert goes on, Eberhard stresses that there is no new physics in the book. Yep, yeah, it's just replacing the myth by the actual physics. So this is what Robert says, to understand lift you need only Newton's three laws and something called the coriander effect. The coriander effect is just the tendency of air or e any even slightly viscerous fluid to stick to a surface. It is flowing over. And so you can read the rest of it if you like. I'll give you a few seconds. And on to the next one. This is the diagram and with the flight instructions. I'll give you a few minutes to read that if you like. So this is me. The surprising thing is that I can get away with believing the myth for most purposes rather than the actual physics. So going back to Galileo, same thing happened with him. If you want to refuse to accept what Galileo says and stick with the then existing theory, which was geocentrism, then that theory could be adjusted to fit most astronomical observations of his day without there being a need for the new theory. And that's the situation. You can present a myth and in some circumstances, the myth is good enough that it will actually fit most observations, but it's not really the actual physics. And that's what happens a lot now in science. Instead of the actual explanation, you can get away with the myth. Finish, thank you, the end of this little video.